today. I'm glad to be joined by a good friend of this ministry, Dr. Rosaria Butterfield, who joins us from her home in North Carolina. It is good to see you again, Rosaria. Oh, it's Chris. It's so good to be back with you all. Thank you. And uh, we have Dr. Burke Parsons with us, uh, of course, over in the Ligonier studio here on the Ligonier campus. And uh, so good to be with uh, both of you. And I've been looking forward to this conversation for some time now. Uh, both Dr. Parsons, from your perspective of a local church pastor where you are the senior minister at St. Andrew's Chapel here in Sanford, Florida, and then Dr. Butterfield, uh, your writings and uh, your testimony that is well known uh, by many, and your background even in academia where you saw firsthand uh, some of the early signs of some of the, yes. the gender studies and uh, some of the identity issues that we're going to get into in this conversation today. Um, I saw just a couple months ago a Gallup poll that tried to break down the different generations um, over the past uh, five, six decades. And it started with Gen Z, then went to Millennial, Gen X, Baby Boomer, and then the traditionalist World War II generation. And what was interesting is that uh, Gen Z, about one in five of the Gen Z crowd is self-identifying now as either LGBTQ, et cetera. Um, and then they compared that percentage to the other generations. And we see a doubling uh, in each generation coming from the traditionalists up to the Gen Z crowd. And of course, the rapidity of change has been at light speed over the past really seven to 10 years. And you've been on the front lines of this, Dr. Butterfield. What is happening mm -hmm. out there? <laughs> What is happening? Well, part of what is happening is the church, unfortunately, is following the world. And as the, the evangelical church follows the world, we are going to see more of a muddled understanding of what it means to be a Christian. So a little clarity on the subject would be very, very, very helpful. What you see right here are competing ideas of what it means to be human. Um, there is the biblical idea that we are made in the image of God and we are made male and female. And, um, and we are made with the potential to reflect, reflect God in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. And then you have, in comparison, a Freudian idea which has really become the backdrop of both the LGBTQ community, but also not just the LGBTQ, blah, 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 LGBTQ community out there in the world, but there's an LGBTQ community in the church. It's called Revoice. And so this, these are very big deals. But anyway, the, 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 the Freudian idea that, that from which um, the alphabet soup comes is the idea that you, uh, what makes you human is that you have sexual desires and sexual objects of desire, and those are different, and they are all morally neutral. And um, once the church loses its ability to, um, to really understand that to, to reflect God's image, we are made in God's image, not as God's image. So to reflect God's image requires certain things like fearing God, and I think once the church loses that, the, that it, the integrity of that, we can't expect to not see those numbers go up for two reasons. One, um, there's such a muddled, confusing message that unbelievers don't know what they're hearing when they hear the church, but also God is angry. So we are incurring the wrath of God and confusing everybody all at the same time. That's a, that's a, lose lose situation and that's where the confessional church has no excuse and we need to jump right into this conversation so just orienting the conversation then around uh, first principles of the fact that we mm -hmm. are created in the image of god um, it, walk that out for us and how does that relate then to this conversation around gender and identity issues yeah, well, I think it's going to be for this conversation, and not just our little conversation here, but for 
the conversation the church is going to want to have with the world, I think it's going to be foundational. Um, to be made in the image of God has uh, with it necessarily a creational impulse. In other words, we are made as men and as women, and we are made as men and women by God, designed by God for a purpose. And that purpose is found in Genesis 1, 26 to 28, to be fruitful and to multiply. And so what we see in that is that biblical marriage is normative, that heterosexuality is natural. And uh, talk about like hate speech right now, right? Let's just jump right in. Um, uh, those are things that the uh, that a kind of modern understanding of personhood would would necessarily reject, you know, out of the box. And I think what's happened is the evangelical church has tried to take um, sort of um, vague ideas that come out of the New Testament, but fails to attach them back to the creation ordinance. And so they just kind of dance on the surface. Um, and what I mean by this, say something like freedom in Christ. Um, I lived as 10 years as a lesbian um, through the very faithful ministry of Pastor Ken Smith um, and the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church. I had the the gospel, along with probably 500 meals presented to me over the course of many, many years, and came to Christ. And in coming to Christ, I had to reject and leave and lose everything that I had. I couldn't, I couldn't bring it with me because that's not what the gospel calls us to do. That's the gospel message. But, um, um, let's say, so when I say I have freedom in Christ, I'm saying I have the freedom to live out God's call for me as a woman, which means, among other things, um, that I reject being a lesbian. I reject it as an ungodly, uh, but more than that, a kind of unreal form of personhood. And this is this might sound very strange, but I, you know, I've said this before publicly and I mean it. There's no such thing as a gay person. Now, what I don't mean by that, I don't mean that there aren't people who live in this world and call themselves gay. I mean, when God created mankind, he did not create us to be gay. That is not an image bearing category of personhood. But at any rate, I could say I have freedom in Christ. And a friend of mine who now is what we would call a side A gay Christian, someone who is now, quote unquote, married to a woman, she could say that she is free in Christ to do those things. And we could both look to the same New Testament passage to arrive at that. How? Well, I'm attaching that New Testament passage back to the creation ordinance, and she's not. And so I, I, I raise this because I think there are times when in the church we are really confused. We do not believe, we especially who are confessional Christians, uh, who are, uh, you know, who believe in the Westminster standards, we do not believe that there are problem passages in the Bible. We do not believe that the Bible has manifold interpretations. And yet we live in an, in an evangelical world that says that's the case. How do we get there? One of the ways we got there is we have abandoned the creation ordinance as a foundation for what it means to be human. And instead, we've allowed more Freudian ideas to enter into our discourse. Even the concept of gay Christian should cause uh, genuinely converted Christians uh, some, some serious concern. Does that muddy things or does that answer things or does that at least carve out some territory? I love I love listening to you, Rosaria, and I have loved listening to you for many years. And every time you open your mouth and teach, I I learn something and I'm so grateful that uh, we're together today. It's just such an honor for me. Um, you know, you mentioned something earlier regarding unbelievers not hearing uh, clearly what it is the church believes. 
And as you've alluded to, the big problem as well is that Christians themselves are actually not being taught what the Bible teaches. And uh, so there's lack of clarity in the world. There's a lack of clarity in the church. Uh, there's a lack of clarity among Christians as to what we're to think and what we're to believe. And that's one of the reasons we're talking today, because there is such confusion. There is such a lack of clarity. And I think the problem is, is that there are many uh, uh, so-called Christian ministers, teachers out there who are presenting their perspective or their views on these matters as if they are an option, biblically speaking, as if their perspective is based on Scripture when they very well know it's not. It's not, it's not being uh, grounded in Scripture. It's being based on very loose hermeneutics where you have to do all sorts of gymnastics to make a text say what you want it to say. I'm grateful for those who just come out blatantly and say, we know that the Bible doesn't teach this. We know that Christ didn't teach this. We know that both Old and New Testaments, you know, do not teach this. Uh, and I'm grateful for their boldness and honesty, quite frankly. The problem is that Christians don't know what to believe, because when they hear language like gay Christianity or gay Christian, they have come to believe more or less that that's acceptable because they've heard from uh, so-called Christian ministers say that it's acceptable. I once, uh, just a few years ago, had a conversation with a well-known evangelical teacher, and I was expressing my concern over this whole matter of so-called, quote-unquote, gay mm -hmm. Christianity. And uh, just in expressing my concern very politely, very respectfully, he said to me, he said, well, you're just a fundamentalist. And I wasn't quite sure what he meant by that, but what I've come to realize is that he was saying that because I believe the Bible is the inspired and inerrant Word of God and our only infallible authority for faith and life, and that I'm going to govern everything I believe and everything I do in life by Scripture, that I am in his mind a fundamentalist. I think what he doesn't understand is the reason that we say these things, I say the same thing, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, is that we believe that the Bible knows us better than we know ourselves. And he believes that our personal feelings know us better than we know ourselves. And so I think that's an important divide. And if you believe those things, you're going to create two different gospels but they're going to be so close that only a discerning ear is going to be able to distinguish them between the two. So when it comes to gay Christianity, we would say, I would say, and I would say this as somebody who lived as a lesbian and called herself gay and thought that's who I was and all of that, we are going to say that homosexuality is first and foremost a sin. It is a transgression. It is a denial of God. It is pagan. It is dangerous. That is what it is first and foremost, because that is what the Bible tells us that it is first and foremost. At the same time, in my heart, that's that wouldn't have been my, uh, my heartfelt response. I would say, well, this is who I am, or this is how I feel most integrated as a person, or, and so at some point, Every true believer has to decide, does the Bible know me better than I know myself? Or do I get to be the arbiter of that? Because you're going to end up with two different notions of homosexuality, even if you want to claim that you're on the quote unquote conservative side, which I'm not, you know. Um, but for example, if when I say that homosexuality is first and foremost a sin, that would be very, very different than um, evangelicals who will say, no, no, um, you know, God really whispers about sexual sin and he really shouts about, um, you know, other kinds of sins. And therefore, homosexuality in the church is first and foremost a problem of unanswered prayer. Um, all these people have tried to pray the gay away and they've been so hurt by the church and they've been so, 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 um, so unappreciated by the church. And, 
you know, and, and it, again, I experience a certain level of cognitive dissonance when I hear this. It's not that I don't think the church can't be careless in the handling of people's feelings. We all can be. But do you have any idea of the way the gay community treats itself? I mean, seriously? Do, do, we, do we really not understand the level of danger that is in the gay male uh, community? Do you think that that kind of sexual engagement is safe? Do you think that the level of emotional and verbal abuse in the lesbian community is good? You know, so again, I, as somebody who has very much lived in, on both sides of this conversation, I think that um, we are not dealing with the facts. I mean, it's very difficult to make an assessment without that. But ultimately, back to just kind of winding this up, we have to decide whether we believe homosexuality is in first and foremost a sin or if it's first and foremost a problem of unanswered prayer. And this is where it becomes very, very important for the Christian, for the Christian who struggles with sin, for the Christian who, with these kinds of sin, for the Christian who struggles with other kinds of sin. We need to understand what that sin is in light of scripture, not what that sin feels like from our experience with it. Now, I'm not saying our experience with it won't become pastorally important. Of course it will. But we need to deal with what it is first and foremost. Otherwise, there is no fear of God in how we proceed. And if there's no fear of God, then what there is is fear of man. And that's a snare. I'm very grateful that you have brought up uh, Sigmund Freud just a moment ago. Uh, I think too often, too many Christians in our day are being more informed by the ideology and philosophy uh, and theories, really, of Freud than they are of Christ. Um, and I think the relationship between feelings and the, if you will, according to Freud, the suppression or repression of those feelings and the relationship of our feelings to, to love, the love that we want, the love that we desire, the love that we all want from each other. We want to love, we want to be loved, uh, we want to feel loved. Uh, we've not really done a good job teaching uh, the church about the relationship between feelings and love. You mentioned a few minutes ago about hate speech, and this has been something I've been thinking about a great deal over the last several years, that we will continue to be charged as Christians, speaking the truth and speaking the truth in love, we will be accused of not only being, of course, hate groups, but uh, using hate speech, when the reality of it is, is that we love people the most because we're willing to tell them the truth out of love and in love because we want what we know, according to the Word of God, is truly best for them, what truly frees them, how they can truly feel loved. Uh, but right now, so many in the world and so many in the church are being sold a lie that true love is just letting you feel and express yourself and however you want, whenever you want, with whomever, however, uh, and whatever you want to be and whatever gender you want to believe yourself to be. And that breaks my heart. Yeah. And, and I would think part of that is because we've lost an appreciation for the distinction between the public and the private. So um, the world loves the public, right? The internet loves the public. The, you know, everything, you know, you, feel, you have these feelings will come out because you need to have those feelings affirmed. You must, everything must be public. And yet the Christian life is, is actually not measured by any of those things. And so one of the reasons I think that Christians have become, I think one of the reasons that Christians, Christians are too quick to be quiet when they're told that they're practicing hate speech 
is we don't have enough opportunity or we haven't exercised enough opportunity to practice this in private. And here's, can I give you an example of what I mean? I mean, I was just walking my dogs the other day and um, my two neighbors who are uh, two older men who identify as gay, they were waiting for me because they wanted to pick a fight. I mean, I don't mean real fight, but you know, a verbal fight. They, they wanted to know specifically why all these evangelical Christians are not embracing the COVID vaccine as the perfect example of loving our neighbor. I mean, aren't Christians supposed to love your neighbor? And why aren't we doing it? And I thought, you know, it was so interesting because you know, I'm almost 60 and they're 60 and 65. And so, you know, so they sort of land this on me, you know, before, I think before they had their second cup of coffee, I, had, I was alert. Um, and I said, well, you know, gentlemen, didn't we all live through that other pandemic, right? AIDS? I want to know why gay men didn't just uh, practice uh, appropriate uh, boundaries around sexuality the way the CDC recommended. Um, didn't you want to love your neighbor or, or your partners? You know, why did you reject that? And, you know, I, it was you can imagine this conversation. It was, uh, I said it a little more directly than I'm going to say on camera for League and Ear, but you know, we, we had quite a discussion. Um, we had a discussion about how um, everybody wants freedom and how they exercise their ability to love, but people define their freedom differently. Christians locate their freedom in scripture, which says healthcare is a, is a domain of the family. And gay men located their freedom to love in their personal feelings. But here we all are, another pandemic, and another example of how, well, maybe you understand more than anyone, dear gay neighbor, why Christians aren't in uniform in support of this idea that a vaccine is an example of loving your neighbor. And so what I'm saying is, these are my neighbors. We're friends. We're going to see each other at a barbecue next week. We're going to share uh, iris bulbs once we dig up uh, the garden. Uh, we, we can afford to speak directly to each other about things of real import. But people who spend their entire life thinking that real conversations are publicly waged on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or wherever, they lack the ability to do this. And then fundamentally, they lack the ability to say to the revoice side of gay Christianity, um, they lack, you know, they lack the ability to say, yes, I do think you should stay in the closet. I really do, genuinely. In fact, I think it's really unsafe for uh, a, a, a self-affirmed Christian to come out of the closet. If what you're talking about is you struggle with an indwelling sin called homosexuality and you're not practicing it, there's simply no reason on the planet for everybody in the world to know that. The people who need to know that are your pastor, your elders, and a few close friends. In fact, only a fool would want the entire world to know what your indwelling sin pattern is. But because we've lacked, we lack this understanding between public and private, we immediately presume, back to that Freudian narrative, that everybody must come out and describe everything about us all the time. Not only is that immodest, it's dangerous. It gives Satan a great deal of bandwidth with our personal problems. So yes, speak honestly, speak directly to the very people you're going to have barbecues with next week. Maybe do a less, little less of that on the internet and a little more of that at the block party. And it is amazing how God will indeed bless your witness for Christ. Because some of those very people are people like me who don't look like a likely candidate for God's uh, saving grace, but actually are. I know both of you care deeply about the local church and uh, really see that as your primary uh, field of care and concern. And, and you also care about passing down the truth to the next generation. And what, what would we say to the, the parents, the grandparents, um, about this moment where we are seeming in our culture to struggle to define what a boy is, what a girl is, what a man is, what a woman is? Um, so maybe just you know, take a moment to talk about the, um, the difference between gender and sex, 
Um, is, is gender a psychological category or a physical category? How would you approach these questions just from the standpoint of orienting some of uh, the moms and dads, the grandparents out there to this conversation? Right, right, right. Well, prior to 1963, there would have been no distinction between sex and gender. The distinction between sex and gender was a particular feminist enterprise that was meant to suggest that while women are born with a creational capacity to bear children, uh, that is not in, no one should ever extrapolate from that any sort of sense that there's a pattern. In other words, God designed you that way without any kind of patterned social normativity. So right there, Christians should say, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. God is the master designer. No one designs anything without a purpose. We are patterned for a purpose. So, so that is a that is a explicitly feminist um, interjection that really is the foundation of transgenderism. And I think it just really is so important that Christians know that what transgenderism is, is the sin of envy. Envy is a funny sin pattern, right? It, it sometimes can pass as maybe humility or brokenness or, but ultimately envy is desiring that which God has denied you, that someone else has. Now you want to say, well, but what about intersexuality? What about gender dysphoria? Um, Yes, yes, and yes. There, there certainly um, can and 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 are um, examples of chromosomal ab abnormalities that contribute to um, a a a distorted sense of who you are in the world. Um, but chromosomal abnormalities, like say, for example, Down syndrome, are not. That's not a we wouldn't say that a person with Down syndrome is a different category of personhood. Now, we certainly would say that a lifelong physical disability is a spiritual difficulty, and the church would want to certainly be, certainly be sensitive to that. Um, but what we're dealing with today is not people with chromosomal or hormonal abnormalities. Um, we're primarily dealing with young girls who are indoctrinated by YouTube influencers. And how do I know this? Well, I mean, there was one gender clinic, pediatric gender clinic in 2015, and there's what, 500 today? Really? I mean, why would we need that? Um, um, why is it that um, LGBTQ um, um, indoctrination in the public school system is not part of sex education, but it's part of anti-bullying, an anti-bullying program, which means parents cannot exclude their children from it. I mean, I don't mean to be, uh, you know, it's been a long time since I've actually met someone who is genuinely gender dysphoric. The people I meet are young girls who are genuinely indoctrinated. And so what I would say to the grandparents, what I do say to the grandparents and the parents is this is difficult, but the Lord has already spoken to us, and it's in Luke 14, um, verse 25, starting with verse 25. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And I, I think what's important, obviously, hate doesn't mean hate in the in the modern sense. It means love less. It means grandparents, parents, you must love Jesus more in order to witness wisely to an indoctrinated child. You must stay connected to your child without joining in that indoctrination. And that requires, in a very powerful way, that you fear God more than you fear the rejection of your child. Um, Proverbs witnesses to us that the fear of man is a snare, and a snare is an instrument of execution from which you never extract yourself. So if you are going to be of any good to your grandchild or child, 
you must stay connected without becoming indoctrinated. And um, that's, that's vital. But what you must not do is you must not read bad books. You must not read books like those that Preston Sprinkle is writing. You must not read the books that are coming out of broad evangelicalism that says, well, you can be, you know, transgendered and Christian or, um, you know, maybe maybe your transgendered child really has a male brain and a female body. And maybe that's where the ontology or the 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 origin of it is, you know. We are seeing so many people de what's called detransition right now. And that means that they have lived for years as a, uh, they've taken hormones, they've had surgery to medically mutilate themselves. They've been living as a different uh, sex and now they have heard the gospel and they are working to come back to what is true, but they're they're genitally mutilated and the church needs to be ready to receive them um, because the good news is the the, the gospel in, in the glorification of the body at the resurrection the great resurrection there will be no gender mutilation you were born male and female you will be restored at that time and so in some ways the gospel might be the best news to people who have gone through gender reassignment surgery than, than anyone on the planet. So Christians need to make sure that you are, you know what is true. And I think, you know, and I just, I think the other thing that might be very difficult for Christians, um, and it's it's 1 Thessalonians 5, 14, you need to know what you're dealing with. Are you dealing with the unruly? Are you dealing with the faint hearted or are you dealing with the weak, right? That is a, that is a verse that says, you know, reminds us brothers, um, you know, rebuke the un unruly, um, uh, build up the faint hearted, help the weak, encourage the faint hearted, help the weak. And um, I just listened to a wonderful sermon by, um, by uh, Drew Poplin and it was, you know, on how important it is to know those three categories. But Christian, if someone is being unruly, even if that person wrote a book and is your pastor, you need to find a better place to worship. You know, par part of how this has happened is Christians have not been discerning about the truth of the gospel. They, and, and part of why they haven't been discerning, I think, is because we've been, um, you know, apart from confessional churches, we've, we've isolated our children in a children's ministry where they go from hearing a you know, a, a, a sermon on one Bible verse from the New Testament to a bouncy ball, well, that's really going to help you deal with problems, right? Um, and then we wonder why they can't deal with problems. Uh, you know, we, we, we have an entire evangelical mega church ethos that says, uh, you, you know, God cares about this world such that this world is his primary concern. And your primary concern needs to be finding unity in peace and social justice. And then they can't suffer. And we wonder, why can't they suffer for Christ? Well, no one, it's the, it's the teaching. So I would say it's all, it, it's all coming down to the basics. Christian, you will suffer. Suffer well for Christ. Know who your Lord is. Know what he says. Know what a false teacher is and flee. Find a good church if you're not in one and do it now. For If not for your sake, for the sake of your grandchildren and your children. Um, this isn't a game. This isn't a social club. This is life or death. We are all called to hate our sin without hating ourselves. That's hard. You can't do that on your own strength. So encouraging and uh, helpful. As we're seeking to encourage uh, parents, uh, how would you approach teaching uh, your children uh, positive um, perspectives on uh, gender? Um, and, and not just, of course, you know, dealing with the negative side of um, you know, what some people are struggling with in terms of 
gender dysphoria, but how do we continue to set before the next generation, particularly as you're saying, uh, Dr. Butterfield, there's an indoctrination machine um, and it is very effective. Yeah, it is very effective. And, um, uh, and maybe we don't want to get into this, but how your children are schooled is an important question right now. Um, a, a, a Christian parent's ability to protect a child from government education is um, a little different today than it was before 2015. 2015 was a seismic shift in um, government overreach on all kinds of things. Um, that was, of course, the year that the Obergefell decision, the uh, legalization of gay marriage in all 50 states, was put forward. But with that came an entire under new understanding of personhood, because with the Obergefell decision came this idea that to deny the validity of gay and lesbian, bisexual, transgendered identities is a form of hate speech because it attacked the dignity of all of those representations of human life. And so it's actually called the dignitary harm clause. And I think this is also where Christians just need to say, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, this might, this is going to be my civil disobedience moment then, because dignity is found in the image of God, not in the falsification of that in uh, LGBTQ ideas of, of really perversion and sin. But I think a positive approach is really, um, teaching our children the great joy of, of being a wife and a mother and the great joy of being a husband and a father and the great dignity and the importance of, uh, of a wife who is um, caring for her home as a primary priority and a husband who is protecting his family as a primary priority and being clear that our Christian life is not being filtered through some almost Christian feminist blogger who says this or that or the other thing, you know, being really clear that we're allowing our, our faithful pastors and elders to disciple us, not these, um, you know, not, not the kind of quote unquote Christian world. Now, if that sounds really old fashioned, then um, I think it's important to go back and, and, and reread and see if that not is the truth. Do we believe, for example, that God would design people without a purpose? You know, does anyone, does the engineer who designed the bridge that you drove over to get to work today, did he design that bridge without a purpose? I hope not. I sincerely hope not. So do we believe that about God? Did God really not design man and woman for a purpose? And if so, what is the integrity and the beauty of that purpose? And I think there's always a temptation in the Christian life to think that you need to correct all the bad opinions out there. And you know what? I, who has time for that? You need to live your life with, with godly integrity and pray that the Lord would magnify and bless that. But I think that part of the confusion, and I've seen that in some of my speaking events where a nine-year-old will come up to the microphone and, and during a live Q&A and ask a question showing that that nine-year-old is more versatile in uh, critical gender theory than uh, most of the adults in the room. Well, where did that child learn it? He learned it from school. So how is he being discipled? And how do you think you're going to counteract that if you are part of a goofy, foolish evangelical church that, um, that is more concerned with appealing a large number of people and making them feel good than actually honoring God? Well, it's impossible. Without intending to, that child has been sacrificed now. And I really do think that it, should the Lord tarry and um, people will look back on these years, you know, I mean, within the last week of at least this particular recording, we have a nominee for the Supreme Court who can't define what a woman is and a man who won the NCAA uh, Women's Swimming Championship. And, and for the most part, 
we're just nodding and smiling. Why? How can we do that? Um, I think the church needs to develop some courage. I think we need to develop some courage to, to, to have the fight now. We, we missed the moment. We should have had it in 2015. But we are not going to appease this problem. Truth, we must speak truth, um, to, especially to our children. And we must protect them from these ridiculous ideas. And that means being more careful about their schooling and also about the worship that you are uh, experiencing, that you are presenting this child with. I think these are serious times. I think people need to wake up. Dr. Parsons, um, when we think about our, our children, the next generation, these young men and women who are seeing so much um, deviancy um, celebrated in the media today, and then that filters down to their friends. And I know a lot of young men and women out there want to uh, follow the Bible and want to follow um, God's design for them as a man and a woman. And they're swimming against the tide today. What would you say to them, to that young man, to that young woman, young woman who um, is hearing um, difficult uh, words from good friends uh, and they're wanting to stand firm for Christ and for the truth of God's word? How would you encourage them, as Dr. Butterfield has said here, to have courage? My counsel to uh, young men and women, uh, whether in high school or college, who are uh, desiring to stand firm in their faith and desiring to uh, be courageous is to do just that, is to stand firm in their faith, not in their feelings, uh, to stand firm uh, in what they know is right, not what they feel is right, or not what the culture tells them is right. And I think this is the the real crux of the problem for the church in our day. I'm, I'm really not that concerned about what happens at the state, local governments. Uh, they're, they're pretty much gone. I think that's why a lot of Christians um, don't say much, because they know that this battle um, is pretty much over uh, when it comes to our culture, when it comes to uh, government, um, when it comes to schools. Um, but the problem is really in the church, that we are not grounding people properly in the Word of God, and we are not teaching people that it's the authority of God and His Word that is foundational to everything. I mean, this is why we get so many of these sort of, uh, what, what, what they want to uh, propose as sort of innocent questions. I mean, even sort of the tone of uh, the revoice movement across various denominations, um, it's as if they're, they're humbly wanting to come and ask these questions when they know very well they're not asking questions. They're making assertions and declarations that are contrary to Scripture. The reality of it is, is that not only Christians are doing that, but even the world knows that. I mean, there is this thing called natural law where God has given to all human beings a sense of, of what is right by God's standard. Uh, human beings know that there is man and woman. There's male and female. They know they have feelings as a result of the fall, as a result of sin in our minds and our hearts. Uh, men and women struggle. There is there's this gender dysphoria. There's confusion. There's worry. There's conflict and turmoil about uh, what someone is feeling and, and what someone might be desirous of. And as Rosario said, maybe even envious of and jealous of not being content with what God has uh, done in them and how God has made them, but wanting something else that's different. The reality of it is, is that we have elevated feelings over the truth of God's Word. And so when it comes to these teenagers and 20-somethings and 30-somethings interacting with other people they meet in the workplace and uh, in, in school uh, and, and online and everywhere, is that they don't want to hurt their feelings. They, they don't want to say anything that's going to upset. They don't want to be disliked. Uh, we all want to be liked. We, we all want people to like us. We don't want to be hated by our neighbor or by our classmate, by our colleague or coworker. We want to be liked. And so we don't want to say anything that's going to hurt anyone's feelings. Um, as, as all mothers taught their children growing up, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Well, that is maybe helpful when you're five, but it's not helpful when you become an adult. 
Uh, we have not done a good job of training our young people to be able to speak truth and stand their ground in the truth because they love, because we as Christians are to be the most loving. We are to be the most caring. We are to be the ones to say against the entire world and even against so many within the evangelical church that we really love you and we care enough about you that we're going to tell you the truth about how God designed men and women and how God loves all peoples from every nation, from every tribe, and how we can have that love through Jesus Christ, through the one unchanging gospel that is proclaimed to us in the one unchanging word of God. And so, Chris, just as you said, have courage, stand firm in the faith, contend for it, and love your neighbor and care for them in a way that they've never been loved and cared for perhaps in their entire life by coming along next to them and telling them the truth about who God is, about who we are as sinful human beings, and about our only real hope in this life, Jesus Christ. May I, may I say something at this point? Um, so I'm, I'm part of the Reformed Presbyterian Church, and we believe in something called the Mediatorial Kingship of Christ. That has been a very helpful doctrine for me as I interface and have courage in this world, because I actually don't think the world is supposed to go to hell in a handbasket. I, I really don't. I mean, I, I believe that Jesus Christ is king. And I, I think that something that has been extremely helpful to me is that image that Puritan Thomas Goodwin gives for what it means to be a Christian, that God's justification is that moment, that judicial act, where he takes the person chained to Adam, unchains him, and now chains him to Christ. And there's no going back. We're not swinging between Adam and Christ. We're in Christ. Now, do we have patterns of sin? Absolutely. What about people with very sinful lives, former lives like my own? Well, homosexuality is very much part of my biography, but it was not part of my nature from the moment, the very moment that God justified me, even though my life was a mess. And so part of having courage is remembering some of those things that were told in the Psalms, right? Psalm 110, God put the church in the midst of his enemies. It's not an accident. This isn't an accident. That's where he placed us. John Calvin about that verse says that Christians are to regard the hatred of the world as nothing. Nothing? Nothing. And that would include the hatred of your grown children who say they're never going to talk to you again if you don't go to their gay wedding or some of those other things. I think that there is a uh, profound confusion that somehow feelings are, a, as, as, as Burke was saying, a, a preserved category. Well, the Bible witnesses that we, and the Bible counts as sinful actions, both our feelings and our practices. That's why lusting in your heart is adultery and hating in your heart is murder. So I would say it is extremely helpful to remember um, our catechism, to remember our confession of faith, to remember the great privilege that it is to be a justified person in a very dangerous world. And to not believe it when people try to say, well, I'm gay, but I'm gonna sanctify my gayness. Well, you can't because sanctification is rooted in justification or it's nothing. And so again, that might seem very difficult, but I think Christians, you know, as, 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 as Burke said, teaching truth is an act of love. And that's not a, um, that's not simply a, a, a catchy expression. We may live or die on these words, so may they be useful. And um, 
our children will not be better off if we cave. Uh, our children, are, the next generation will not benefit from watching our generation offer nuance to something that God has, spent, has spoken directly and clearly and distinctly. The world that God created is created on binary oppositions, whether the transgender community likes that or not. That's the truth, and we stand there. So I know a lot of people in the church can feel almost a cultural whiplash and trying to keep up with how fast culture is moving and how some of these terms are being tossed around today, and they're just trying to catch up. Um, what counsel would you give to them, Dr. Butterfield? Oh, that's such a good question because the vocabulary is unbelievable. Um, I, I, you know, I mean, if it was radical in 1963 for Kate Millay to say that there are, you know, two genders separate from sex, well, there are now what, 10,000? I mean, how many options does Facebook give you? It's, it's absurd, and I think it's important. And I, I, I counsel parents on this all the time. You are allowed to be sanctified in your ignorance. Uh, you, you can't keep up with this. You ought not to keep up with this. Part of staying connected to your child means letting your child tell you what non-binary means and, um, and, 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 you know, and, and what, what all of, uh, why pronouns matter. And then you are still the parent. You don't stop being a parent because this is an adult child. You don't stop putting the gospel before your child as the, um, as the only uh, solution to the punishment that God has in store for, for, for us. I mean, you, you don't stop that. So I would say, be, uh, let your child explain that. And then don't be too quick to be in lockstep with it. Um, you know, I, it's such an, an interesting thing that pronouns have become the, um, I don't know, just a, an area of, of such huge battle. Um, and, I, you know, you might not know, you know, Ayn Rand wrote um, a, 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 a dystopian novella about pronouns too. Um, it's called Anthem. And in, and in that uh, particular novella, it's an act of civil disobedience to use the pronoun I, because everyone must call themselves we, because it's a collective society. Now, you know, you, you can say what you want about Ayn Rand or about dystopian fiction. I am an English professor by training, so of course I would bring that up. But um, I think it's important to realize that a, a certain level of civil disobedience is needed here for parents. You named that child, and you don't have to comply with the lockstep of the culture. Uh, you don't have to do that. Uh, so I, I would just say, yes, be, be, be sanctified in your ignorance. Let your child explain, and, um, and don't think that by obeying the indoctrination, you can help your child. That's not what the Bible offers to us. The Lord Jesus Christ promises to hold your ankles as you're dangling over that cliff, which I know you are. Um, be in a church that can uphold you. Be in a church that isn't waffling, that isn't adding mud to the clarity. Um, and be ignorant of the things that God calls you to be ignorant of and wise to the things that he calls you to be wise in and pray. Rosario, that is such good counsel. Um, and Chris, I really appreciate the question and the way you phrased it, because I, I think we all feel like there's so much coming at us. We're just bombarded uh, daily, uh, everywhere we look, by, by, by so many concepts and words and phrases that most of us, uh, most people I talk with, they don't know what they mean. Um, and and try, quite frankly, as I've been studying, uh, you know, transgender uh, ideology uh, over the past several years, even within that world, uh, they're they're changing their own terms. They're they're redefining uh, their own terms uh, as we speak, and uh, and of course they're free to do that. And 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 if we're if we're needing to study this, then we need to do 
determine what these words are. If we're writing on this or speaking on this, we certainly want to make sure we are representing uh, the opposing side uh, accurately. But as Rosario said, there there is something about who we are as Christians that is to be, as Christ calls us, um, innocent of evil things. And so whenever I come across uh, Christians, uh, moms, dads, grandparents who say, I, I don't understand all of this. Uh, I, I don't, I, I can't make sense of this. I, I don't know what A side Christianity is or B side Christianity or, or how can, how can people call themselves uh, gay Christians? What, what does that even mean? How can people who were born as uh, male or female feel or identify as the opposite sex? And, and they don't know what that means. And I want to say to them, you're not supposed to know what that means. You're you're supposed to be confused. It's supposed to not make sense. And it's okay. Because I, I think we all feel that, it was just the bombardment. And what we need to do, as Rosario was saying, is we need to plant ourselves in a gospel-preaching, Bible-preaching, faithful church that loves the Word of God, that teaches people the Word of God. And, and you know, that's hard to find these days. You know, 30 years ago, we could have said, hey, go to that church, go to that church, and different denominations, and, you know, but you could pretty much guarantee they're going to hear the Bible and, and hopefully the gospel. Today, it's not the case. Just because there's a church in every corner doesn't mean the gospel is preached in every corner. Today, you're, you're hard-pressed to find a faithful church that just teaches the Bible, and that's what we really need. We're not going to change the culture. Only the gospel changes people and hearts and cultures change. We need to be concerned about helping the church to remain firm and steadfast, gracious, loving, truth declaring and squarely fixed on the unchanging word of God. And the ultimate goal is, the ultimate goal is not winning a culture war. The ultimate goal, as Rosari has said throughout here, our time together today, the ultimate goal is that we were made for a purpose. God made us for himself. He made the world for us to inhabit that he might have a people that he would save for his own glory. That's what it's all about. It's not about our feelings ultimately. It's about God's good pleasure. It's not about what makes me happy ultimately. It's about what glorifies God. And that's foundational to everything we believe. Thank you again for being with us today and helping us to think through this subject. And uh, thank you, Dr. Parsons, for joining us. Uh, if you're watching this and you have found it uh, helpful and encouraging, edifying conversation, share this uh, with others in your community, in your family, in your church. Um, and uh, we hope that this would be a way in which we are helping more and more people to be conformed to the image of Christ as they think about his truth and his word as it's been given to us. Uh, thank you uh, again to our panelists today.